Once you have chosen the Linux distribution you want to install on your desktop or server, ensuring your chosen machine meets the physical requirements, we can then move on to getting it set up for use. You will find some distributions, such as Ubuntu, offer a desktop and server edition. The desktop edition will ship with a GUI, an interface that allows the user to communicate with the system in the form of images, animations and audio, as opposed to just text. With the server edition, it will not include this and will rely on the user to interact via a system console. A system console is internal to the Linux kernel and provides a way for the kernel and other processes to send text output to the user and to receive text input from the user, typically via a keyboard. On your desktop, you will find installed an application known as the terminal. This is actually an emulator of the real thing. When you boot your system for the first time, you will see the console appear and display the boot log of the kernel. During this process, you will see information about detected hardware and the status of the boot procedure. At this point in time, the only software running is the kernel. Once it has finished booting, it runs an initialization process and handles booting the rest of the system, including any programs that will run as background processes. As we are working on a Windows machine, we will be using a virtual environment with VirtualBox and Vagrant to emulate the operating system with a precise 32 Ubuntu box. As it is a virtual box, I have to SSH into it. SSH is a cryptographic network protocol for secure data communications used to log in to remote systems with a username and either a password or private and public keys. Whether you choose to use the console or terminal from the GUI, we will be using the shell prompt to enter our commands. Just before the cursor you will see your username, system name and current directory name. As I am in my home directory, my current directory is identified by the tilde sign. After the dollar sign is where we enter our commands. The simplest way to run a command is to type the name of the command into the prompt. If I want to find out the date, I simply type date, and in return, I receive the full date as a response. Command names can be passed options to alter their behavior. A great example is the command ls. By itself, it will return a list of the files in the current directory, like so. But let's add a few options to alter its output. Command options typically consist of a single letter preceded by a hyphen. Hyphen L outputs a long listing. Hyphen A lists all hidden directories, and hyphen T lists the files by time. You can also eliminate the extra hyphens and group them all together like so, and you will receive the same result. In the next tutorial, we will delve into the file structure and navigating the file system using commands. Thank you for listening, and don't forget to subscribe to the SMKS channel.